Covenant Church has been rooted in the North Park, San Diego neighborhood for over 70 years. And we believe that God is restoring his creation and renewing lives in our church, our neighborhood, our city, and cultures around the world for his glory. My name is Patrick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd personally love to invite you to join us Sunday at 10 a.m. in North Park at the corner of Howard and 30th. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Covenant Church. If you're a guest, a special welcome this morning. My name is Patrick, and I'm the pastor here at Covenant. You know, in our worship services, we follow an order. It's called a liturgy, and that word liturgy means work. It's the work of the people. So as the people, what work do we do as we gather here in this space? Well, we hear. We hear from God the reading of the scriptures And we give to God in song and in prayer. And we also meet God because his spirit is present here as we sing and we pray and we encourage each other. We hear God's word read and preached in the taking of communion. So as God's people, as we begin today, why don't we stand and we'll read our call to worship that starts our liturgy, this work where we hear from God calling us, inviting us into this space to worship, to give him his worth. And the reading is from Psalm 40. I'll do the leader portion. Please join in in the all portion. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. All who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, Lord is great. Father, we thank you for the truths of this psalm that call us into this space that, Lord, when we cry out to you, you are a God who hears us and you lift us up. Lord, you lift us up out of low places and you put us on a firm foundation, the foundation of your son, Jesus Christ. And we rejoice because of that. And we declare with with all of creation and all of creatures and churches around the globe that our God is great. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
was lost in darkest night yet thought I knew the way the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will if you had Indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in my place, you bore the wrath reserved for me. So all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and land my song. Please uh, feel free to take a seat. You know, I went through a period where I would run a lot of marathons and I did a lot of training and uh, it was pretty hard on my body because my, all my muscles would get really tight and all the running and everything and uh, I'd, I'd start experiencing pain. And so I would go into the chiropractor and I'd walk in with a little bit of pains and aches and maybe walking a little crooked, one leg little longer than the other. And uh, the chiropractor through pushing and pulling and cracking and adjusting would get me back into uh, a better place. I'd walk out a little happier, a little better, a little straighter. Um, and what's interesting about that is that I would walk in with a, 
spine, and as a person, and I would walk out the same way. I still had a spine, and I was still the same person, but I was just adjusted a little bit more into what I was supposed to be, what I'm supposed to be. And today, or like every Sunday, we have a, um, a practice that we do that's a, a confession, and uh, where we sit before God. And today, if you're a follower of Jesus, you walked in through that door, and you walk in a fully forgiven, loved, a beloved daughter and son of God. And as you walk out today, you'll still be that same person, right? Nothing will change of that. But we have this practice of confession where it's a time for us to just sit and rest and take stock in our lives. In in this past week, in the past couple of weeks, maybe what's going on in my life that I may want to talk to God about where God may want to come in and tweak and adjust and get us back into that place with him. Not that our our standing with him changes whatsoever, but what is it about our life that God can adjust a little bit? Um, Right now we're going to do the uh, practice of confession. I'm going to give you 30 minutes or 30 seconds. (laughs) Actually, that would be a long one. (laughs) Sorry, Patrick, I'm taking over. (laughs) I'm going to give you 30 seconds to um, read the confession of sin. After that, we'll read it together as a family. And then after that, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds, not 30 minutes, to uh, then sit before the Lord and maybe confess something that you have or hear from God what he might want to talk to you about um, in your life. So let's take uh, 30 seconds to read the um, confession. All right, when we read that together, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit so that we may more perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Should take uh, half a minute. And as always, God has uh, encouragement for us. And today this comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those that are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Father, we believe that you are a good God who dies for his people, who forgives his people, and who also forgets and gets rid of all our sin. We thank you for that. We pray for faith today to believe that anew, that we are cleansed and forgiven, your people, and that you dearly, dearly love us. And we know that you do this because you are a good God with a loving and kind heart. And now um, we are going to read the uh, Nicene Creed. Because not only as we um, confess our sins, we also confess what we believe as a people. And the Nicene Creed is one of the basics of what we believe as the people of God. 
We're going to read this together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. He was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life in the world to come. Amen. And now we'll continue worshiping in song. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can
Holy Spirit, thank you for being our comforter. Thank you for coming alongside of us. Um, thank you so much for being a thing that binds us together in a community. Um, Lord, I know that I fall short all the time, and I know that um, I will never be perfect, not a day, not a moment, <laughs> that I will always fall short, but that you have looked on me in love, and that when I couldn't choose you, you did choose me. And Lord, I just thank you for the gift that you've given us um, through your son, um, through the shed blood that we have hope and redemption in, and the fact that you've given us a comforter to walk through life with, um, and a community of people who can also look on us in love, knowing that we all fail, um, and that as a community, we can reach out to other people because you've given us that, because you've called other people that you love the whole world, Lord. Um, and I just ask that you be with us and continue to uh, just keep our ears and our hearts open for what's here today, Lord. Um, and I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to go to our uh, greeting time. We have five minutes. And also, it is the third Sunday, so elementary and middle schoolers, you get to go to the back, and then uh, you get to party hardy down somewhere else. So my name is Will Carreras. I'm one of the uh, pastoral interns here uh, at the church, and that's uh, been a great process so far, a great journey. Um, and we have some announcements today. So we have a couple of um, men's and women's breakfasts coming up here shortly. February 5th, uh, save the date for the gentlemen. It's going to be a Saturday morning, getting started around 8 o'clock, going to about 9.30. Uh, it's going to be a good time. You know, we, we are a family here, but if we come roll in on Sunday and roll back out, we have limited time, and you just had five minutes to talk. Uh, it's not a lot of time. And so the breakfasts are meant to give us space and time and opportunity to get to know each other. Um, so that we can better fulfill the mission and the calling and the, the, what, the gifts that God has given us, which is to um, minister to each other, to be there for each other, to get to know each other better, and to um, be that family. And then for the ladies, a month later, on March 5th, the same thing. Uh, you're going to have a breakfast. That starts a little bit later. That starts at 9 o'clock and goes till about 10.30. It also, uh, we have a women's Bible study going on. If you look at your, um, in your um, announcements, you'll find information on there. And then we are starting something really cool. We're starting covenant classes, which that's going to be before the regular service. And you'll find more information on that. You definitely want to be there. I'm going to, I get to be one of the facilitators. So that's going to be great. Um, and that's meant for if you are a uh, planning to be a new member, or if you're a new member of the church, if you want to learn more about, about the faith, um, and that's going to be a good, good place to do that. So um, that's it for the announcements, and uh, let me say a, another quick prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that um, it is a beautiful, warm, winter San Diego day once again. And uh, we get to be here and gather as a community and as your people that you've called. Um, you bless us in such incredible ways. Lord, help us to see that. We pray that you'll bless these times that we're planning, whether it's the breakfast or the Bible studies or the classes, um, that we may get to know each other better, that we may enjoy each other better, and uh, those gifts that you've given us as your family and your people. And Lord, as we continue in our service, uh, may we listen to the scripture that's being read. Um, may our hearts be calmed. Lord, we, we come in here with um, concerns and worries and fears and doubts and thoughts about everything in the world. Let your spirit calm us, slow us down, hear your uh, word being read and hear your word being preached. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'd like to invite Kennerly up to read the scripture. <laughs> Thanks. Mark 1, 16 through 20. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. 
Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Mark 2, verses 13 through 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Will and Kennerly, for leading us in worship. My name's Dominique Goodman, and I'm one of the pastoral interns here. I am the least of all the interns, but by the grace of God, <laughs> I am what I am. Last week, so we're continuing our series in Mark, and last week we saw the beginning of what Mark calls the gospel, the good news, and we learned that Jesus is the Messiah, the King, God's Son, and we learned that not only is he king in divinity, but he's also assumed our humanity, and Jesus as such is our brother, as the terminology pastor used, and because he's our brother, the declaration that Jesus received when he was being baptized in the Jordan is in, because we are united to Christ, the same declaration that we receive, that Jesus is the beloved son of God, so the Father spoke over him. And the good news is that same declaration is the declaration over your life. So as we begin, and as Will alluded to in his prayer, we all come with certain worries, certain concerns. I don't know what your week has been like. I don't know what you're facing in the coming days. But what I do know is you can rest in the declaration that you are the child of God. So inhale, God is Father. Exhale, you are a beloved child of God. By way of introduction, by way of introduction I want to draw your attention to the opening phrase in this text, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. In Christ, we have God walking on the earth. And we typically read this, gloss over it, and continue moving. But I want you to feel the weight of that, that God has entered into history, assumed humanity, and he is now walking on the earth. The first time God is said to be walking on the earth was in the Garden of Eden when he was calling out to humanity, where are you? Humanity at this time is lost fallen, trapped in the throes of sin, Satan, and death. And as a result, the relationship between God and humanity has been severely ruptured and severely damaged. As a result, humanity, Adam and Eve, were deported out of the garden, away from paradise, living in a state of exile. And as a result, so are we. We are all born into this world in what the Bible calls exile. And I wanna think about exile as a helpful metaphor, a lens by which you can view reality and language you can have to articulate why it is the world is the way it is and why we are the way we are. For we live in a world filled with tragedy, trauma, violence, brokenness, externally, but also internally in ourselves. And Jesus Christ has come to reverse that situation. He has come to end exile and he has come to make all things right. So I wanna see this text as the beginning of the making of all things right or stated in the negative, the ending and the undoing of all things that went wrong in the garden. Jesus Christ is God, Jesus Christ is human. And in the person of Jesus Christ, God has fastened himself 
to our humanity, which means that rupture that I just spoke about is now over for God is fastened to our humanity. Up here, Milton's gonna put a picture of Jesus Christ become flesh. Now, this is a scholarly sketch of what a Jew living at the time of Christ would have actually looked like. So this is the most accurate representation of who Jesus Christ is and what he would have looked like. And this is our God become flesh. Now, really quick, I just wanna draw some parallels between the garden and what we see in this text so we can kind of see that Jesus is reversing and Jesus is making things right. You recall that in the garden, God was walking, calling out to humanity. And in this text, we have Jesus Christ walking again, calling out to humanity. In the garden, we saw that God was looking for humans and they were afraid to be seen. Recall that they covered themselves with fig leaves and then they hid and they ran away from God. In this text, you read carefully, Jesus sees Andrew and Simon and he calls them back to God and this time humans respond. In the garden, God created humans to be his vice regents. God is king over the universe and he created humans so that we can rule earth on his behalf and through humans, God's kingdom rule can permeate the earth. But humans failed at their vocation and God's kingdom program was thrown off course. In Mark, we have Jesus who is God taken on flesh, announcing the kingdom of God has arrived. And he is calling disciples, he is calling humans back to himself, and he is commissioning them to go out and be fishers of people. In other words, to participate in their human vocation again. Does everybody see the counterpoints of what Jesus is doing? It's one for one, redoing or undoing what went wrong in the garden. So as we begin, I wanna think about why is this story even here? Let's answer that. Let's ground ourselves for a second. Why did Mark write this story? What function does it serve? And I want to answer that question by saying that this story for Mark is the launching of the new people of God. It's the foundation of the church. It's where the church's origins begin with, and it's what the church's mission is in the world. So Mark is taking us back, so to speak, not just telling us a story, but to remind us that this is where the church movement began of which you are part of. And this is the church's direction in this world. So this text is sort of like a going back to the drawing board, so to speak, or a company drawing in their faculty and coming together and saying, who are we and what is it here we are for? Or to put it in more intimate terms, a man and woman, a woman going back to the first time they dated, the first restaurant and they're asking themselves, okay, where did this begin? And where are we going? Likewise, as individuals, where did your relationship with God begin? As a collective community, where did our relationship with God begin? Where are our roots and where are we going? So this text answers that. But Mark is not only telling a story that is for you to just listen to. Mark is telling a story that invites you into the narrative. Mark wants you to use your imagination and see in the disciples yourself in a mirror that their call is your call. The early church's mission is your mission to carry on. So use your imagination, not just your analytical mind, but put yourself in the story and see yourselves in the disciples. So this, this sermon is gonna move forward in five points. The first point is you are called. My second point is you are seen. The third point is you are wanted. Fourth, you have purpose, and five, you are being transformed. So let us begin with you are called. Let's ask this question. Who is the caller? Jesus Christ, the herald, calls as God calls. In the Old Testament, God's powerful speech is constantly celebrated. He spoke and he created the universe and all that is in it. He called Abraham to himself to create the children of Israel. He called Moses to himself, and God is a God, one of the main assumptions of the, uh, the biblical story is, God is a God who speaks. And when God speak, speaks, things happen. Like God, Jesus also speaks, and he has the power in his own voice to create the very thing he commands. And you see that in the disciples just dropping everything and following Jesus. The text leaves the reader wondering, 
Who is this that people would just drop everything for and go after? We know nothing of what the disciples know of Jesus in this story. The temptation is to read from the other gospel accounts, but I would like to see this strictly on Mark's terms. Mark provides no reason. Mark's point is that Jesus' authority in his voice is the precise reason why people up and leave and just follow him. So the first point is Jesus is the God of Israel and he has the authority to call just as God calls. Now let's kind of flesh out that authority point. In, in the beginning of Mark, Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, is presented as the Messiah, God's son, which is an allusion to Psalms 2, the son who would be king over the nations. He is the Lord returned following the messenger, John the Baptist. John the Baptist in Mark 1, 7 says, one mightier than me will come. Jesus is the mightier one. At Jesus' baptism, he is the spirit-empowered human. He is the beloved son, which is an echo of Isaiah 42, the servant who would be the beloved of God and set this world right. And then Mark sets Jesus out to explain his supreme authority. That begins with, one, Jesus has a power and authority over Satan and evil and overcoming the temptations. Second, Jesus has the power and authority in Mark 1, 15 and 16 to announce the kingdom of God. Now, Mark is presenting Jesus as the one who has authority to call sinners out of death, to call sinners out of exile, and to return people back to God by the power of his speech. So I've, I've mentioned exile, and I wanna flesh that out a little bit. What do I mean by exile? Well, biblically, exile refers to Adam and Eve being deported out of the garden. In Genesis 11, it refers to the nations, remember the story at the Tower of Babel, where the nations were scattered from God and they were exiled across the globe. In the Old Testament, we read of the children of Israel being deported out of the land to Assyria and to Babylon. But Israel's exile and the biblical metaphor of exile is a physical representation of an even greater spiritual reality, which is all of humanity's awayness from the relational presence of God. So we can say this, exile is feeling like you're not at home. Exile is experiencing life as if you're an orphan without the security and love of your father and your creator. Exile is to be in captivity to powers too strong for you. And you can think of addictions, of trauma, of brokenness, things that have you, quote unquote, trapped. Exile is to be made to feel like an outsider, to live outside of the realm of God's promises, God's blessings, is to live outside of God's intended purpose for creating you, leaving you wandering in no man's land. So when Jesus comes and he starts gathering disciples to himself, he's reversing this condition of exile. He's ending bondage. He's bringing you from captivity into freedom. And because exile is a spiritual metaphor, that's freedom from sin and death, freedom from addictions, freedom from depressions, anxieties, gripping fear, panic attacks, whatever it is that you have, that has, that has you bound, Jesus possesses the authority to call you back. Or even we can press that point, if you have a child or a grandchild who's wandering, how do they come back to God? Well, Mark is presenting us with a God who has the authority to call people back to himself. Think about how you even arrived here today. We don't think about this too often in, in um, Christian circles. Why did you wake up as a Christian today? Why are you here at church today? Why are we doing what we're doing? Now, the biblical theological answer is because God called you and God has brought you here. So that's God or Jesus as God who calls, who possesses the authority to deliver you from exile. The second thing I want to point out about call being called is call, being called is an identity concept. As I mentioned, in the Old Testament, God calls people to himself, both for a relationship and for service. He sets his love on Moses, calls him. David calls him. Israel calls. 
the new people of God in the New Testament, we are called. And the number one identity marker of the people of God is the fact that we are called. God sets his love upon us. God sets his grace upon us. God takes the initiative and comes to where we are at. And by his power and by his grace, he saves us, brings us to himself, forms a new community. And that is what makes us his people. That is what makes us his sheep. So, I, so when we think about the question, the life question, the philosophical question, who am I? This text teaches you that you are the called of God. And I don't know if you've ever started your day or thought about that throughout the day, but who are you really? Who am I really? And the answer is, I'm the called of God. And as a community, who are we? We are those collectively who are the called of God. When somebody gets the revelation that they have a high calling on their life, they'll stop living a low life. We live as if we don't know who we are and we be, be human in such a way as we don't know our true calling. And when people grasp the fact that you are called and you have a purpose over your life to do something, then that will translate into ethics where we'll stop doing what we're not supposed to be doing so we can begin doing what we're supposed to be doing. So being called is an identity concept. Another thing I would like to point out about being called, that it stresses God's initiative and it highlights God's grace. To be clear, what we are reading in, in this text is not a story about people who want God. This is a story about a God who wants people. We are not reading a story about people who are climbing a moral ladder trying to reach God. We are reading a story about a God who has descended in the incarnation and has come to reach people. We are not reading a story about people who clawed their way out of sin. We're reading a story about a God who possesses the authority to call people out of sin. So God takes the initiative he comes to where we are at, and he's already moving. He's already calling. He's already doing something in the world. This puts us on the receiving, responding end to what God is already doing. Another thing I would like to teach you is, in the ancient world, discipleship was a common theme, both in Judaism and in Roman culture. It was a master-teacher relationship. The word disciple in the Greek is mathetes. It simply means learner or student or pupil. So there was a master, a teacher, and then there was a student. Now in the ancient world, particularly Judaism, the student would seek out the teacher, would seek out the master. And particularly those students were those who, one, had the leisure and the, the, the financial stability to actually spend time studying. And they were the ones who typically would go into the synagogue and reach out for the teacher to study the Torah. But Jesus flips the educational norms in that he seeks out the student and he doesn't go to the synagogue. He goes to the obscure town of Galilee and he chooses uneducated fishermen. How do I know that? Because in Acts 4, when Peter and John are preaching in the temple, the Bible says the people perceive that they were uneducated and common men. And that's how, disciples, or that's how fishermen were viewed in that culture. Not only that, we read in 2.13, he goes to Matthew the tax collector, a shunned sinner. In that world, a tax collector or toll booth collector, however you wanna think about that, were the shady of the shady in that society. They were like sinners who were considered beyond the pale. They cannot be helped. And if you were to start a religious movement, where would you go? Jesus is not like us. Jesus goes to the sinful, the marginalized, the sinner, the uneducated. And that highlights God's grace. That highlights God's ability to bring people to himself. The fourth thing I would like to bring up is, in terms of calling, is you are called into discipleship and you are called into mission. So we have this confusion in the body of Christ is, that goes something like this. Is discipleship something for every Christian or is it optional that only some Christians participate in? In other words, are there a group of people who are saved but they're not really disciples or they don't think 
they have a calling or an assignment or a vocation from God, they tend to think that vocation and discipleship is for those elite Christians or professional Christians. Now, Mark answers that for us this way. To be called is to be a believer, is to be a disciple, and is to have a vocation, and is to have an assignment on your life, to have a purpose over your life. Now, I don't wanna say that to cause you to question your salvation. I don't wanna say that like you're not truly a disciple or you're not been truly doing something. I don't want that. What I am saying though is, if you're not fully leaning into the discipleship process or you haven't fully discerned or thought about having a calling in ministry or a calling to do something specific for God, then I'd invite you to flourish the way God intends you to flourish by pressing into that this year. So what is discipleship? Jesus is calling them into a relationship to learn from him, to follow him, to follow his pattern of being in the world, to spread the gospel, to preach and to teach. And that segues into their mission. They are called to go out and invite people in, to share the love of God, to make space at tables in fellowship with people, to preach the kingdom of God, and to do justice in the world the way God intends for justice and equity to be done. So you, to be called is to be a disciple, is to have mission. Now we'll move to point two. You are seen. In verse 16, Jesus walks beside the Sea of Galilee, and the Bible says he saw Simon and Peter. Kurt Thompson, a practicing psychiatrist who works at the intersection of faith, psychology, and spirituality, says this. Every human being born into this world is looking for somebody looking for them. And in order for us to have healthy brain development and in order for us to flourish as human beings, it is imperative that we be seen, that we be looked for, that we be noticed, and that we receive love and acceptance. Because at the core of what we want is to be loved, but in order to be loved, you need to be known. And in order for you to be known, you need to be seen. So being seen makes us feel like we matter. It, it makes us feel like we're human, like we have dignity, like we have value. On the contrary, we all know what it's like to not be seen. What it's like to be rejected or ignored or overlooked or bypassed. It makes us feel dehumanized. But the good news of the Bible is that the Bible presumes a God who sees, and we see in this text that God sees you, God knows you, God loves you because God created you and God desires you. Now, this idea that God sees actually has ancient history. It goes back to a woman named Hagar. Hagar is an Egyptian slave woman of Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham and Sarah were given a promise of a God to have a seed through which all of his blessings would flow. Abraham and Sarah for many years couldn't have a child. Sarah thought, God must be against me. He has restrained me. I know what I'll do. Abraham, go have sex with Hagar. And Abraham goes have sex with Hagar. Now, we typically haven't read the story this way, but that's abuse. If you don't have the power to say yes or say no, then you don't have the power to, be, to have consent. Then she got pregnant. Sarah got mad and kicked her out. And she wandered in the wilderness, pregnant, single mother. And the Bible says that God showed up, the angel of the Lord, which many believe is Jesus Christ. I would affirm that. He showed up and he cared. He loved her. He saw her. And he intervened in her life to help her. And then Hagar responds back and says, you are the God who sees God cares about you, God sees you, God knows all your hurts, all your pains, where you're going through, what you're going through, and he sees you. And this revelation that God is the God who sees, we learn from a woman who's been treated as if she's invisible. And God picked her to teach us something about him that we would otherwise not know. So now Jesus is on the scene as the God who sees, and he sees the disciples, and he calls them to himself, to himself. Now that's important because we live in high ages of interpersonal trauma. Interpersonal trauma is trauma between human beings. And what does trauma try to do? It tries to tell you a story that you don't matter, 
that you aren't seen, that you don't have dignity. If I could give an illustration of what trauma feels like to me, it's like I'm in a glass box and I can see everyone around me and they're enjoying life, but they can't see me and I can't seem to get to them. But the good news is God is a God who sees you. And when you get the revelation that God sees you, the next question is, well, what does he see? And you can learn to start seeing yourself the way God sees you. And I would submit to you that's where healing begins. Second point, or third point now. You are wanted. He saw Simon and Peter, and he said, come, follow me. Now, the word come here in the Greek is duete, and it's an adverb, and it means come here. It's a summons. It's an invitation to come to Jesus. Now, think with me. What does it mean to be called? What does it mean to be chosen, to be invited, and to be selected? At bottom, it means you are wanted. It means God wants you. The one who created the heavens and the earth, he wants you. And that seems rather simple, but have you ever thought about that? Especially if you've been made to feel rejected, neglected, or a parent didn't love you the way you were made to be loved, or a spouse committed infidelity on you. The problem with all those things is it makes us feel unwanted. And not only that, some people feel not only are we not wanted, we are unwantable, as if nobody could ever want us. But the good news in God's call expressed in Jesus Christ is that he wants you and he's inviting you to himself. Jay Stringer, a sex therapist who works with sex addicts, although this can be applied to all addictions. And here's how I would define addiction rather simply. Any behavior you do that brings temporary pleasure with long lasting negative consequences that you cannot stop in spite of the consequences. And that can be applied to anything now. So in some sense, that's what addiction is. And, and he says, all of our unwanted behavior stems from this deep feeling we have in ourselves that we ourselves are unwanted. Why is it the young man hangs around the wrong crowd and does things to be accepted? Because he feels unwanted and he wants to be wanted. Why is it people sleep with people who don't love them back? Think about the woman in John 8, caught in the midst of adultery. And I'm fairly certain if you asked her what was going on, she would tell you, I just want to be loved. I just want to be wanted. So you're wanted. But not only that, you are being invited into belonging. Brene Brown, does anybody know who Brene Brown is or heard of that name? Brene Brown, for, she's a, a social worker, has a ma or degree in social work, and she works at the University of Houston. About four years ago now, she did a TED Talk, and she decided to talk about shame. And she very simply defined shame as this overwhelming feeling that I am unworthy of true love and belonging. Very simple. But she struck a chord with millions. Literally millions of people said, that's the language that has described my life. The young generation, when I talk to them, if I can sum up what they're going through, I would say the words, not enough. They feel not enough, not good enough, not holy enough, not pretty enough, not rich enough, not smart enough, not enough. And because they feel not enough, it leads them to the conclusion that they are disqualified and unworthy for love and true belonging. But in this text, Jesus Christ is one inviting you back into triune fellowship with the Father, Son, and Spirit so that you can have belonging with the life of God. Not only that, he's calling you into a community of other believers and into a family where he offers you belonging, where he says you matter here, where you have significance here, where you're treated with equity here, where you belong here, you have status and you have significance. So in this text, God through Jesus Christ is offering you what you've always wanted, which is true belonging. My fourth point, you have purpose. I draw your attention to verse 17 where it says, I will make you become fishers of humans. 
So not only are they being called into discipleship and relationship, as I mentioned, but they're called out of the world to spend time with Jesus and then to go back in the world to fish for people. They are those who have been caught in the net of God's grace and love and forgiveness. And they are now being sent out to go catch other people in the net of God's love and forgiveness. And that is your purpose. You ever thought, what am I to do as a Christian? And there's very specifics we can answer that question. And I don't wanna give you a formula because everyone in here is different and has a different calling from God, but it's all subsumed under this larger narrative or this larger purpose of gathering people to bring them out of exile and back to God. It's telling people or starting with seeing people just like God saw us, inviting people and telling people, God created you in the image of God. That's why you like this, this, and that. Come back to him. And it's telling people about the love and forgiveness of God, preaching the gospel of people, sharing your testimony, sharing your faith to people. That is a purpose that has eternal value. Now, the thing about purpose is, as humans, we all need some kind of significance. We all need to feel like what we do matters. Like there's some, something that extends beyond ourselves and extends beyond history so that we feel like we're not wasting our lives or that we, so that we feel like there's some value that, that goes into eternity for the very minute details and small deeds that we do. And Jesus is offering you to participate in his mission of reconciling the world. It's offering you the invitation to come back to function in your human vocation the way you were meant to function as a human. One of the things I'd like to um, pick with our common understandings of being saved just to go to heaven, it leaves no room for what we're supposed to do now. And not only are, that's, is that good news, but you're also being called to actually live according to the purpose God has placed on your life and to function as a human being. So that's the good news, you have purpose. My last point, you are being transformed. This is an important point because anytime we start thinking about doing something for God or living out a human vocation, inevitably the question is raised, well, how am I to do that because I'm not good enough or I have some weakness in my life or I have some struggle I'm going through or I'm not as intelligent as other people. I don't know all that I'm supposed to know and you start feeling insecure. But the good news of this text is Jesus' command to come to him comes with a promise, I will transform you. I wanna draw your attention to the words, I will make you become fishers of humans. Now in the Greek, this is literally the word poeo, which means I will recreate you. I will recreate you so that you can fulfill your human vocation and so that you can live out the purpose that I have for you, says the Lord. So let's think from this text of three examples of transformation. I want to think about Mark, the one who's writing this text, Peter, who's being called, and John, the apostle who's being called as well. Who is Mark? Mark is the cousin of Barnabas who many believe sat under Peter's preaching in church history, believe that he sat under Peter's preaching and he's actually writing out Peter's gospel in this text. But he's also a co-laborer with Paul. And when you get to Acts 15, Barnabas and Paul wanna set out on their mission and continue their journey. But Barnabas decides to bring Mark and Paul's like, no, Mark can't come with us. He's not fit to come with us because he abandoned us in Pamphylia. In other words, Mark is somebody who started out in discipleship, started out in the mission, only to fail at the mission and actually abandon the mission. He failed at serving God. And it is Mark who God chooses to write to the church about the mission of God. Mark, the one who failed as a servant, is the one who God chooses to write the gospel of Mark, which portrays Jesus as the perfect servant. You're reminded of Mark 10, 45. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Many scholars believe that's the theme of this text. So who would you choose to write about a servant? Somebody who serves really well. Who does God choose? Somebody who's failed at serving. 
Now let's think about Peter. Everyone knows Peter's a repeat offender. All he does is fail throughout the gospel accounts. And what did he do? He denied Jesus. Sometime later in the book of Acts, he's standing before the children of Israel. And Peter literally says these words. You denied the Holy One. Peter. Well, you think of the audacity of that. Someone who denied Christ telling other people how they denied Christ. But the Bible tells us they were cut to the heart and they actually repented and got saved. So God takes a man who denied Christ to preach to people who are currently denying Christ to get them saved. Let's consider John the Apostle. In Luke 9, around the 52nd verse, Jesus and his disciples are going into Samaria. And the Bible tells us that the Samaritans rejected Jesus. So John said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn them alive like Elijah did in the Old Testament? Watch this. Jesus doesn't rebuke the Samaritans who rejected him. He rebukes John, the judgmental believer. And Jesus says to John, you don't know what manner of spirits you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy lives, but to save lives. Now, what's John most known for? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. So God takes a wrathful, angry, judgmental man and turns him into the apostle of love who tells the whole world about God's unconditional love. So I don't know what it is you're currently struggling with or what your past is or what you've done wrong or what you don't think you could possibly do right. The good news of this text is Jesus is saying, I'm going to transform you And I am going to take the very area you struggled in and actually make that your strength and how I'm going to reach people through you, which might help you discern your call. What is it you're called to do? Well, I would invite you to look at your past and say, what is it that hurt you? What is it that you used to struggle with? What is particular about your story I would submit to you, God is going to use that very particularity transformed by his grace, and that would be the means by which he reaches people and the audience that he wants to reach through you. So the good news is you are being transformed. Now, the disciples have come to Jesus, and we're told that they're going to follow him. And they follow Jesus. And where do we go? Jesus walks to the tax booth, calls Levi, the tax collector, like the disciples, Levi leaps up, follows Jesus. Levi has an an idea. He's going to go get all his shady friends. And I know he has shady friends because he's a shady tax collector. And he brings all his friends. And Jesus reclines and eats dinner with them in his house. Do you have room in your theology for a God who can recline and eat with sinners comfortably? Because that's what we see in Jesus Christ. What does he do? He makes room for them at the table. He loves them. He forgives them. And he shows them his grace. And that's what the disciples see. And that is what we are to do. Because not only that, as Jesus continues into his ministry, he would go to another table. The night before he was crucified, he would install the Passover where he would take bread, break it, and say, this is my body that's broken for you. He would take the cup and say, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And we are all invited to this table where there is love, where you are seen, where you are wanted, where you have family, where you have belonging, where you have friendship, where you have purpose over your life, and where the love of God is putting you in a process of deep healing, deep transformation, and deep growth so you can live out your human vocation. Let me pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, I thank you for for what we see 
in your son, Jesus Christ, a loving God who has feet to walk to where we are, eyes to see us in our helpless state, a voice that carries power that can call us out of our darkness back into your light, back into your purpose. And you make a table of room for us where you love us, where you forgive us. And I thank you for your promise that you are transforming our lives so that we can live as the humans that you intended us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. You know, I wanna lift one idea out from what Dom shared with us about you are wanted. And this is a table, it's a picture of the bread and the cup to remind you that you are wanted. That Jesus, as he reclines at this table, he invites you and you are seen and you are wanted. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup, the cup of the new covenant in his blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And whenever we eat from the bread and we drink from the cup, as we were reminded from the text, we are seen, we are wanted, we are called into mission, and we are being transformed because of the grace and the mercy of Christ. So, Father, we thank you for this table. We thank you for these tangible, physical reminders that show us the type of God that you are. You are the God that saw Hagar. And you are the God that sees us and the God that wants us. The God that calls us into a life of grace and mercy and purpose and transformation. And I pray as we hold and we take and we eat, the physical reality of what we're doing will remind us of your steadfast love for us. We pray all this in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Well, I invite you by grace through faith to take and to eat and to drink now. All the poor and powerless and all the lost and lonely And all the thieves will come confess And know that you are holy And know that you are holy And all will sing out hallelujah And we will cry out to our content and all who feel unworthy and all who hurt with nothing left will know that you are holy and all
Receive the Lord's benediction as you go. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you. Amen.